in math tricks. So uh, thanks to the organizers for, um, for inviting me. And um, I guess for the second time in the space of about a month, I'll be talking about quasi-Einstein metrics again. This is uh, joint work with uh, Eric Bio and Hari Kunduri, who's, uh, Eric is at Seattle, Hari Kunduri is at McMaster, and Sharmila Gunasakaran, who's here, who is probably out there somewhere in the audience, but you've all met, or maybe not out there somewhere in the audience, maybe online. Okay. Uh, so uh, for the general relativity people here for the next few minutes, you'll be bored because I want to discuss horizons, but I want to bring it up for people who are not in general relativity. We have a significant metric measure space community here. I think it's going to have some significance for that community in the, um, you know, in the future. So, um, and also it'll make it well-defined what we're talking about. So, for relativists, this is a really trivial and straightforward diagram, but for people who are not in general relativity, I guess it's mystifying. This is a picture of Minkowski space, just R4 with the Minkowski metric. And over here, it very much looks like R4, and uh, the, um, uh, the null, the um, vectors that are uh, zero in the Minkowski metric, but are not zero vectors, they're indicated there, and those are the trajectories of light, of course, uh, particle, physical particle will travel on so-called time-like trajectory, which is vertical. You can now do the uh, Minkowski space version of the map from, uh, 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 from T to arctan T that takes infinity into a finite distance, pi by two. If you do that, you pull the infinite regions out here in, and you get a diamond-shaped picture like this, where the light rays all end up going to the future along here and along here, every time-like curve will end up there, every uh, time-like curve of bounded, uh, bounded velocity will end up there, and the past will be mapped into the bottom part of that diagram. So these are generally called conformal diagrams or Penrose diagrams, Penrose-Carter diagrams. Uh, the, the terminology, the script I indicates infinity and it's generally pronounced scry, Scry minus for past null infinity, scry plus for future null infinity. And that's very standard to rel relativity people, but always a little unfamiliar and we've, to, to other people. And we've done pretty much precisely the map I've mentioned before. And what you get is the Minkowski metric. I should start to use this if I can. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm using the wrong button. No, I still use the wrong button. Okay, let's, uh, got to get used to this, sorry. There you go. One more try. There we go. Where was I? The Minkowski metric, which is down here, I'll simply point, uh, gets transformed by this change of variables into a, uh, into a metric here. I've also done a conformal transformation. I've dropped a factor in front. The spatial part now is basically the metric on a three sphere. And that actually tells you that this thing out here, which looks like a, a large circle or something, is actually one pole of a sphere. It's just a point. Okay, that's kind of boring, but to continue to bore the relativists in the room, this is a picture of Schwarzschild space-time. The diamonds you saw before now resemble these two regions here, but I've got an extra region drawn in the middle. What this is supposed to indicate is if you travel at the speed of light and you're in this region, you will get out to infinity, but if you are in the central region, you're going to be trapped. You will run into the singularity, it looks on this diagram as if light is still moving outward, even in that upper region that hits the squiggly line. But in fact, the uh, curvature is so great or the gravity is so strong that light that uh, is trying to move outward is actually drawn inward. This is a remnant of that conformal transformation that I've hidden in the background. It's actually collapsing. So that region is called the trapped region. And so now we have our first definition of a horizon. Take future null infinity, scribe plus here, and take everything to its past, you'll get all of this region. It'll have a boundary, and the boundary here is designated, in fact, the top part of the boundary is designated H plus, and that's the so-called event horizon, or future event horizon of the black hole. The trapped region is called the black hole. Something else happens in the trapped region. I've tried to indicate that by drawing a spatial surface indicated by sigma. So the other thing that happens in here is take a, um, 
take a, imagine a spherical light bulb, the surface of an ordinary light bulb. Uh, let it emit a burst of light from that surface. And as I've mentioned before, even though it looks like on the diagram the light's traveling outward, it's actually traveling inward. So that gives a notion of what it means to be trapped. And that surface, it actually has its so-called null mean curvature in the outward direction is actually negative. It's um, concave, it's converging inward. So um, the boundary of the region where, those, where you have those closed trapped surfaces will actually also lie right here, but this is something that lies in sigma, and that's, um, that's called an apparent horizon, and it coincides with a cut of the actual horizon in this diagram, and that's because we're in Schwarzschild space-time is static, but that gives us our second definition of horizon. There's also the notion a little bit more weak. Uh, these surfaces are uh, marginally outer trapped surfaces, and you, so you'll hear that term mentioned as well, MOTS in the jargon. Uh, now, let me see if I push. <coughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's right. Let me see if I can push the right button this time. There we go. So now we've had a few different types of horizons. I'll enumerate all of, or most of them here. We've had the definition of future event horizon. I'll just say event horizon. Uh, the boundary of the black hole region. It's a space-time concept. You have to know the whole of the space-time to ask what is the past of future null infinity. There's a notion, there's the apparent horizon and also the notion of a MOTS. I will, uh, I, I will simply um, duck the issue because I'm really only interested in Schwarzschild space time for purposes of illustration. Um, and when I come to actually talking about horizons, I'm going to talk about one of the other types. So, um, but they'll all coincide in, uh, in what I want to discuss. So, okay, we have the future null horizon. We have uh, the notion of apparent horizon, which is a, uh, uh, not a teleological notion. You don't have to know space for all of uh, its future to define that. It's a lower, it's one dimension lower than the event horizon, but in the Schwarzschild example, it coincides. Here's what I'm actually going to talk about in the talk, so-called killing horizons. And that name, that comes from Willem Killing, uh, who apparently was a really nice guy, despite the unfortunate name, according to history. Uh, it's a hypersurface along which a so-called killing vector field becomes null. So in the picture we had a moment ago, let me go back. There we go. Schwarzschild actually is static. It does nothing in time. So you have an isometry here which translates you in time. We haven't shown it, but the tangents to that isometry so-called killing vector field, they satisfy a differential equation, Killing's equation. So there is tangent vector field out here. That tangent vector field is time-like here, but it goes null right along that horizon. So this gives us a third notion of horizon. And in what I will be talking about today, they will all actually coincide. A couple of other notions that won't play much uh, in what I will say today, the notion of a Cauchy horizon, which is if you give some initial data and you look at its future development, none of the diagrams I've shown up to now will illustrate this very well. Sorry, so um, this killing vector field generates a, a one parameter family of isomorphs. Yeah, isometries. And so in the exterior of the black hole, they sort of do this, and in the interior, they do that. Yeah. So that's right, that's actually what they do. So they become, that, uh, that particular killing field becomes space-like in the interior. And they just, along the horizon, they just push along the horizon. They just push along the horizon. So there's also the notion of Cauchy horizon, which was not illustrated in any of the diagrams I showed you before, but I think someone else had the care black hole up earlier, and that had the notion. That's important for uh, cosmic censorship. In fact, it was Michaelis de Fermos who had it up. And uh, I know in the, um, in the other side of things, the non-smooth, particularly measure, metric measure side, where you're looking at Lorentzian length spaces, it's really uh, quite, 
quite nice that you get a Hawking singularity theorem. That's really, I think, quite an achievement. But then really, I suppose where you're eventually headed is into questions of cosmic censorship and what extendability means in that very weak context. And Cauchy horizons are going to arise there. So I thought I would mention them. Uh, there's finally the notion of a cosmological or particle horizon. I will mostly skip that, but that's a, um, so there's several notions of horizons. Perhaps my main point is I'm going to worry about so-called stationary black holes. They have a vector field like the one I've shown you that is time-like near infinity, but not necessarily inside the black hole, for example. But the one I showed you was for Schwarzschild. That one is also twist-free or hypersurface orthogonal. I won't need that condition and won't want that condition. When I have that condition, in Schwarzschild, the black hole is called static. When I don't have it, it's merely called stationary. So what's the difference? Take a Kerr black hole, it rotates. Rotates at precisely the same rate all the time. So in some sense, nothing changes in time. It's always rotating at the same rate. On the other hand, it's not quite as static as Schwarzschild because it is doing something in time, it's rotating. So that's the distinction. Kerr is stationary, whereas uh, Schwarzschild's static. All right, uh, I want to say something about the topology of black hole horizons. It, um, when I first began to learn about the subject, it um, surprised me that one could say things about the, I'm not sure why it should, because it's very natural in Riemannian geometry that you have a curvature condition, you can say something about topology sometimes. Uh, the uh, event horizon topology is governed by several different theorems. I've mentioned here topological censorship, which was an idea of Friedman, Schleich, and Witt in 1993. The other contribution there is Galloway, Schleich, Witt, and myself in 1999. If you have a space-time that is nice in the asymptotic region, asymptotically flat or anti-de-sitter, that came up this morning, think of that as the Lorentzian version of asymptotically hyperbolic. Uh, and if it satisfies uh, various causality conditions, then basically the map from the fundamental group of Scry to the fundamental group of that region outside the black hole, designated by a D here, is surjective. Codified language, what it really means is if you've got a loop at infinity, um, well, if you've got a loop in the interior, that loop must be deformable to a loop at infinity. <coughs> So there are uh, no extra loops in the interior that don't exist at infinity. So the topology of infinity governs the topology of the exterior region. And then if you think about that, let's draw a little black hole that is a, a donut, probably one sitting outside, probably examples out on a tray out there at the moment, and you draw a causal curve through that donut you can't deform that to infinity without passing into the black hole, and that would actually be a loop. You could actually form a loop then in the domain of outer communicate, the exterior region, which would not be deformable to infinity. So you can get a handle on the topology of the event horizon that way. And in fact, what this really tells you is if you do have an event horizon that is a torus, in this case, infinity must wrap it as well. This is impossible to draw. But imagine a, a torus and then just a bigger torus engulfing it. And that would have to be infinity. It, it's, sort of the icing on the it's the icing on the donut. So, um, if, and now everybody's thinking about coffee break. <laughs> if you weren't before. <laughs> Okay, so there's another uh, horizon topology theorem and it predates this and it's altogether different. But this, by the way, is a very uh, non-smooth notion. You hardly use any differential geometry. You do use the Rochaudry equation, which is something that I notice in the metric measure community gets replaced quite quickly. This, however, uses a lot of differential geometry. It's Hawking's topology theorem and it predated topological censorship by 20 years. So it refers to, uh, so topological censorship refers to event horizons. This refers to apparent horizons and the more modern formulation of Matsus. So um, 
Should I quote it? By the way, it uses a different Ricci assumption. In topological censorship, you assume the Ricci is non-negative for all null vectors. Here you assume so-called uh, dominant energy condition, which is written over there. Uh, and it's basically the, um, it's basically a version of the uh, topology theorems of minimal surfaces of Shane Yao fame, for example. So uh, it really, ultimately it tells you that a, um, an apparent horizon has to be of positive Yamabe type. It, uh, under, these, under this energy condition. So that basically means positive Euler characteristic. If you have four space-time dimensions and two-dimensional parent horizons, so you have to be a sphere if you're orientable. Uh, you, uh, in, um, so that's this case. In five space-time dimensions, if you're orientable, you can be a sphere, you can be quotient of a sphere by discrete group, you can be S2 cross S, or you can be a connected sum of those. And in fact, oh, I've gone a little too far. We can, we can say something about the connected sums, but I'll, uh, I haven't prepared a slide. I'm going to leave it. Oh, let's try to go back again. Under that energy condition. The Taurus case was dubious for a long time. Hawking thought that he had an argument that solved it. Greg Galloway said he didn't. Greg finally tied up the loose end 2008, I think. So that was open for a long time. But, um, okay. So killing horizons and degenerate killing horizons, which is where I want to go. You see what I have on the slide? It's always a surprise to me what I have on the slide, even though I prepared them pretty recently. So <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so uh, domain of um, Outer communications, stationary, we've said what that means. A timelike killing vector field, not necessarily hypersurface orthogonal. A rotating black hole, if you will. So um, what's a killing horizon? We also have mentioned that before. That's a place where the killing horizon is timelike just outside that horizon and null on the horizon. So it changes its, uh, its nature. Um, now, what else do I need to tell you about this? The uh, Hawking rigidity theorem tells you something about stationary black holes. It tells you that a generic class of them, uh, with the word bifurcate in here, uh, we'll explain, um, will be killing horizons. My main point is that they will be killing horizons. These are the kind of, uh, the bifurcate is basically the, um, the picture I showed you of Swatchel, where you have, in fact, a, a past horizon as well as a future event horizon, and that they intersect on a surface. That's what I mean by bifurcate, and that's sort of generic, but I'm actually going to worry about the non-generic case for the talk. Um, the integral curves, those um, vector fields, in fact, uh, th those parameterize, those, are, uh, those give you a finely parameterized null geodesics. If they are finely parameterized, so if they give you up to parameterization, null geodesics. If they are finely parameterized, then the, that's a special case and the black hole is said to be degenerate. Or, since you've had a talk about thermodynamics today, zero temperature. And it turns out that those, uh, those are the same and the black hole is said to be extreme. So that's a sort of um, a boundary case. And that's the case that I forget surface disappears. What actually happens is that black hole starts to move further and further away from any point in space-time, so to speak. And at the end, you get sort of a throat, and the black hole is all the way down the throat, and the throat actually has an infinite distance from any finite. It's, about, it's really a, a point at infinity. So that's called degenerate killing horizons. Uh-huh. So extreme is the... Uh, the word that goes with black hole when degenerate or zero temperature goes with horizon. Yes, these are exactly extremal care. Those are examples. I think I've got them on the next slide, actually, maybe. Somewhere around here. Here's a uh, Ryzen and Nordstrom. I've got that one. It's a little simpler. It is the usual Hawking temperature.
Yeah, we're in, uh, I, I, I want to be I want to be in vacuum throughout. Although I have Reisner and Nordstrom here, which is of course not vacuum, but it's an easy example, so I, I snuck it in. So the Reisner Nordstrom metric is sitting in the middle. It's got two parameters. It's a charged black hole, so it has a mass and it has a charge. And uh, it's got two horizons. Outside, it's got an event horizon, and that's the locus with this R coordinate equals this quantity. But it's got another one inside, and that's actually a Cauchy horizon. So they do show up in the talk, and that's where this sign flips from positive to negative. And the so-called degenerate case is where these two coalesce. It's where you get a double root of this thing which is also known as the lapse function, by the way. So it happens when you get a double root of the lapse. Uh, got several examples here. I won't really mention them, except to say Reisner Nordstrom is not a vacuum solution. It's got an electromagnetic field. The care solution is, it's a rotating solution. It's got two parameters, mass and angular speed, which is A, and when m equals a, it's just like when m equals q in the previous slide, you get an extreme black hole. It's spinning as fast as it can without basically breaking apart, so to speak, without the horizon disappearing. Uh, a couple of others, the so-called myers Peary, um, and the Myers is the Rob Myers of the Perimeter Institute. Um, this is a higher dimensional generalization of the black hole and then the rotation can occur in different planes. All right, so where are we so far? Uh, so I want to describe the equations that govern killing horizons, and I'm going to be more general. I'm going to talk about quasi-Einstein equations. So killing horizon will be a subcase, in fact. Stationary uh, extreme black holes will, be, will have degenerate killing horizons. This is just definition, really. Um, and the, what's going on in the background is you'd like to classify all of the um, solutions of general relativity, all of the black hole solutions of general relativity. And it turns out that that really divides into the extreme and non-extreme cases. So to try to handle the extreme cases, you sort of look at it this way. The, um, if you can describe the, uh, the horizons, these are data for the um, solutions of space-time. Now, it's a kind of strange data because, as I say, this horizon is really down a tube that goes on infinitely, but it will give you a start. So that's the name of the game is to try to describe these horizons and then get on to uh, solving the black hole uniqueness problem. So. What do I want to say about that? And again, it's always a surprise when I turn around and see what the slide says. I should look at this one. And then, um, right, so um, the, tr the problem is to find all solutions of the Einstein equations. You're either in vacuum or cosmological vacuum, a cosmological constant. I'll just say vacuum when I mean perhaps with a cosmological constant. Or with Maxwell electromagnetic fields or other macroscopic matter. Um, there's something called supergravity, which is a particularly convenient place to try to do this. We will stay away from that today and stay in the first two cases, vacuum. All right. Um, so, list of known results, not, uh, uh, there's too much to say here, so I won't try to really say hardly anything. Um, the, first the first example of uniqueness theorem for a black hole was due to Werner Israel in 1967. Um, it turns out a, a University of Alberta colleague, more or less, although he resigned on the he uh, he left on the day I arrived. I hope there was no correlation. <laughs> so, uh, um, and um, in fact, he did that work while he was on leave on sabbatical at the Dublin Institute. Uh, Masood Al Alam was also a U of A postdoc. So uh, that was the first, there's a list of uh, uh, various randomly chosen developments. Uh, degenerate horizons, there is not uh, too much. There is the uniqueness of extreme rise or Nordstrom under various uh, conditions, namely um, it's, it's unique if you have only one horizon component. If you have many horizon components, it's still unique if they all have the same sign of the charge. Um, 
the uh, uh, extreme care, there's a uniqueness theorem that assumes analyticity at the horizon. Uh, anything else worth noting at the moment? So there is, oh yeah, the non-uniqueness is worth noting. The, um, there are two distinct black hole or black ring metrics in five space-time dimensions that have the same mass and angular momenta. There's more than one angular momentum if you're in five dimensions. These two are noted here. Uh, stationary rotating black holes of non-zero cosmological constant. That's my shorthand for cosmological constant. That, as far as I know, is an open question. Okay, so let's get on to the so-called near horizon geometries. So now I want to take the Einstein equations, vacuum Einstein equations, the whole space time, and get an equation that governs just the horizon itself. So the trick is as follows, and I think probably due to Harvey Real, but um, not entirely sure of the history, which it may even go back to Peter Hayacek, but um, to give uh, Gaussian null coordinates based at the horizon. So you're just putting coordinates on a hypersurface, but a null hypersurface, and then in a small neighborhood off of that hypersurface. So the form of the metrics up there, I use different notation than what has developed in the field. They, uh, I've got an X where uh, the practitioners put an H, but H gets used for so many things. And, um, so uh, we have a killing vector field. It's here denoted D by DV. And uh, not much to tell you about it, except that I want to take a limit where I will uh, expand along the V direction and focus in, in the radial direction, taking epsilon to zero. That basically just kills the R dependence in these functions because everything else cancels out and you get down to here. I will uh, enforce the Einstein equation on this. And also I'm gonna take a special case where X is a closed one form. This is called the static case. The static degenerate horizons uh, will obey it, but so will other degenerate horizons. So it doesn't indicate, it's not an if and only if. Uh, all the static ones obey this, will obey this, will have to obey this, but. Don't lose a dimension, that's right. But I am gonna throw away two dimensions because I'm just gonna focus on, I want an equation governing this metric. And this is actually the metric induced on, you could say a cross section of the horizon. This is, uh, this is the metric on the horizon, except that you have this null direction as well, which is d by dv, but I'm gonna mod out by that. Good. So what are the implications of the static vector? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, then it would be a weight for a measure. But of course, I'm not going to take X to be a gradient form. I'm going to come close to it, but not close enough. I'm going to take it to be closed form, but not exact. So therefore, I'm not going to make contact with the metric measure. Uh, because it'll be interesting, and <laughs> because it's the condition that you actually get from static. Yeah, so, so I will include static. I will include uh, exact. But I just won't assume it. But somehow, uh, a while back, you said there was this Hawking theorem that said that the right. topology had to be zero. So when you satisfy the um, dominant energy condition. So at least in that case, the thing would become exact. Yeah, in that case, it would be exact. And the Hawking theorem, by the way, uh, gives you information in four space time dimensions. It gives you information in five space time dimensions. It governs the Yamabe type, but the Yamabe type doesn't tell you much beyond five space time dimensions. In fact, it doesn't tell you what you want to know beyond five space time dimensions. About? It doesn't tell you whether closed is right? Uh, it, well, you could put it that way. It doesn't tell you much about the topology. Uh, it's, it's only very, it does tell you something, but not enough. And here I won't have a dimensional restriction, although I will eventually treat individual dimension cases. So I can mostly get rid of the dimension restriction here. So the implications are that the Einstein equations in uh, let's say n plus two dimensions of the space time reduce to n dimensions on cross sections of the horizon. And this is what they reduce to. Uh, if you're static, you get the closed condition. The Einstein equation reduces to these four, but it turns out that these three down here are redundant. 
If you solve the first one, the second one, first two, solve the first two, use this then, use your solution to define y, and these are identities, so you can dispense with them. Number three is definition four, five identities. One and two will completely take care of the static case here, and static means closed x, not necessarily static space-time, but includes static space-times. Uh, all right, so this I think says something I've said before, that the um, black hole uniqueness problem, the way that we will try to treat it here is by studying the near horizon geometry uniqueness problem. Um, but that's sort of, it's not one-to-one. -one. There can be many black holes that have one near horizon geometry, so it's not going to give you uh, everything that you would need. You will need more data than we can examine using these techniques to get uniqueness of space-time. Uh, mention some cases where things are known for uniqueness of near horizon geometries, namely with a U1 symmetry, the circle action. You've got uh, uniqueness, um, you've got uniqueness of the care or care with a cosmological constant near horizon geometry due to Kunduri and uh, Lucetti. Dimension three, if you look at homogeneous manifolds, the solutions are enumerated uh, by uh, Alice Lim, who was a graduate student of Will Wiley in her thesis. And lesson spaces here should be lens spaces. Um, U1 cross U1 symmetry, then you have a little list of what's possible for near horizon geometries. Lens spaces. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, consider a, a Z2 action on my letters. <laughs> so, all right, so the near horizon geometry equation is sitting there, but I'm just going to make a little tweak in it. I'm going to let that last coefficient be a parameter. I'm going to call it m, which does not mean mass, it'll just be any real number apart from zero. And then you get something called the quasi Einstein equation. So if you can prove something for this, surely you can prove it with a general M. In principle, M could even be infinity. This would be the ricci soliton equation, but it turns out it's not a good idea to try to prove things for infinite M. And in fact, for negative M, the situation is also different. So I will stick to positive real M in these, uh, in what I'll say from here on. And mostly what I'm interested in is when Will the solutions be Einstein? Good. So, the rigidity question. This theorem showed up in paper by Krishkel, Real, and Paul Todd in 2006, which is if you take the quasi Einstein equations, closed manifold, and now that's a horizon cross section, so it's natural to take that to be closed manifold. X a closed one form. Now, sometimes I've written X as a lead derivative. Take that to be the uh, metric dual vector field to X. If Ricci is positive in this case, and the near horizon geometry equation holds, then, uh, so if the, um, oh my, I didn't define that. Let's go back. Oh, there it is. Yes. So when I put an, no. <laughs> When I put an M up here, and it's a two there, oh, that's a typo, that should be an M. By having an M up here, I will mean Ricci plus these two terms. This should have been an M. I cut and paste from up above where it really is a two. So M is the dimension parameter. Yeah, it's a synthetic dimension parameter, yeah. Okay, so when that combination called the Bakri-Emery Ricci curvature is zero, with X closed and the manifold closed. Uh, they did it for M equal two, but uh, the proof doesn't depend on M equal two. M can be any positive real number. Then, um, then uh, you get rigidity. You have to have an Einstein manifold as your horizon. They also said that if you have this equation with a negative Einstein equation, except with the bakri amory Ricci, then it reduces to the negative Einstein equation. Lambda, the so-called cosmological constant. 
if you had positive cosmological constant, and remember for them m equal two, and now I think actually we, we care about that a little bit, and if the dimension of the horizon cross section were two, so in four space time dimensions, then positive Einstein. They, uh, they gave one and three as a theorem, and they said for two, actually they said for two and three quite explicitly, it also holds. Um, and it was quoted as theorem 4.1 in Lucchetti and uh, Kunduri, who wrote a beautiful review of the subject in 2014. But statement two is not correct. So. Oh, sorry. So I thought that you were saying that it was correct to use theorem 4.1 in Kunduri and Lucchetti. I am not saying that. It was promoted, it was uh, stated that it was true by CRT and stated as a theorem. It was claimed as a theorem. <laughs> Yeah, except that uh, uh, C Chris Chilriel Todd only stated the lambda equals zero case as a theorem and then had a paragraph that said, it's, we can also show that, but they could not. Um, well, they could, but it, it's, it, it's not true. So let's, uh, I, I'd like to have a... Sorry, so come back again. Yeah. So uh, what about like statement one? Statement one's good, it's correct. Statement three? Three is correct. Every, uh, it's just, uh, just two. Yeah, so, um, so I'll give the correct statement in a moment, but here's a counterexample, very simple. Uh, that's a five-dimensional space-time. This is the three-dimensional G sitting out in the end from a couple of slides ago, and there's X. So simply take a circle cross compact hyperbolic. Now that circle, of course, uh, you can parameterize it by an angle, but the angle will be multiple valued if you cover the whole of the circle. So you can't cover the whole of the circle. In other words, x is not actually, x is locally the gradient of the angle, but it is not the gradient of the angle. Circles are not simply connected or contractible. So um, take that. That is, uh, if I've arranged my constants correctly, sectional curvature for this to be minus two, and that has to do with the four and the two here, you can get any m in there you know, that you wish. And I didn't bother to be careful to figure out whether you put an m or a square root of m in various places, but you can get any m at all from this example. And it showed up in Alice Lim's paper that she wrote based on her thesis, as well as many other examples. So this is negative Einstein. It's very easy to compute the, uh, you, know, you can do in your head the Ricci tensor of this. Negative Bakri Emery, this is, um, um, negative Bakri Emery curvature Einstein. It's not Einstein, that's very important, and so I misspoke. Very definitely not Einstein, and you can see it right away. So, uh, so that's a counterexample. I would like to say a little bit about the proof because um, of the Kirschko Real Todd proof and show how it goes wrong and how it can be corrected because it's so clever. So their proof is actually, it's, it's very neat, just a little too clever, I suppose, but it's very neat. Namely, if you take those equations of a couple of slides back, and I guess I've got to be careful about the time, you can, through the Bianchi identity, eliminate the Ricci curvature and end up with a third order equation for x. So you get that the gradient of the divergence of x plus a few other terms equals zero. You get something like that. So on a contractible neighborhood, you can let x equal df, and then you can write that in here, and you can integrate. And when you do, you get, now let me try this. Near the end of the talk, so if it goes wrong, no, that doesn't work. If I point at this though, yes, then you can see, well, kind of. Right, so if you do that on a contractible neighborhood OI, you will get, oh no, that equation. <laughs> Go back to point. You'll get this equation right here. So I've assumed that x equals df, and I'm on, a, uh, uh, I'm on the ith neighborhood to get this. I can integrate this, and I'll get a constant of integration, then I can multiply it for that factor, and I get over to here. The left-hand side can be re-expressed in terms of x. So the left-hand side is globally defined. Only the right-hand side depends on which neighborhood you're on. So on two such neighborhoods, you've got an overlap. You've got, say, C1 e to the, what is it, minus 2F1 by M, something like that. And over here, you've got C2 e to the minus 2F2 by M. 
And you know that F1 has to equal F2 plus another constant, call it K. But then what you do is you take, um, you simply then take, if I've done things correctly, these have to equal on the overlap. So you can solve for this, and you will get that F1 on the overlap equals, can I do this in my head? It's something like F2 minus the log of m by 2 c. If I get it upside down, just as I say, operate with Z2 action, get it the right side up. You get something like that on the overlap. And then you can just use this to extend F2, F1, to the second neighborhood. If you get a triple overlap, it works out beautifully because this is the same as F2 minus M by 2 log C2 plus M by 2 log C1. And then on the triple overlap, this comes in with a minus, uh, this comes in with a plus sign and C3, it, it works out beautifully that on triple overlaps it works. So the, the cohomology works and you can uh, globally define F and get a gradient vector field. That's the first step in their proof, but you can only do it when your constants of integration are not zero. Now it turns out as well that since these things have to equal on overlaps, all the constants have to have the same sign, but they could be plus, negative, or zero. And the zero case is the one that trips them up because when they're zero, you can't do this. And then you can't extend F. So it's a very clever idea and it works for uh, all of the cases that are non-zero. And so you see right here that also from one of the, from basically this equation on the board, you stick it under an integral sign a couple of times, uh, integrate once to get the constants, integrate again, get rid of the divergence, close manifold, and you will get this condition up on top, that the volume has to equal that combination. So uh, when the cosmological constant is non-negative, then the other side has to be, oh, that always happens. The other side has to be non-negative. So the trouble is that you can get, see if I got it the right way, round, if lambda is greater than or equal to zero, then the, the term with the C cannot be zero. So therefore, what they're doing works. But when lambda is negative, the C term can be zero. So you got to account for it. And that's why it didn't work. So the actual correct theorem is here. Um, just point out maybe number two, which is, uh, it turns out that this equation is still very, very special. It's, uh, you know, it's elliptic, divergence form, blah, blah, blah. You can uh, apply maximum principle and it's very near to rigid. You will get that if uh, the bach ramary ricci doesn't descend to Ricci, so if you're not negative Einstein, then X has to be non-trivial in cohomology, so if you're in simply connected manifold, uh, you can't do this. Uh, has to be incompressible, zero divergence, a constant norm. So, um, of course, the, this part's obvious, you're non-vanishing vector field, constant norm, unless it's zero. And the zero, you're Einstein, clearly. And constant scalar curvature. So, um, very close to Bridget, but not quite. And I'm running out of time, so maybe uh, we can say a couple of special things about n equal two in two dimensions for your horizon cross section, four for space time. They were right. There's nothing new in two dimensions. Their argument in four space time dimensions, their argument will go through. In one extra dimension, five, then you can basically enumerate the case. So we can rule out in positive cosmological constant, we can rule out a couple of things that, um, uh, that could otherwise, uh, that otherwise might, might exist. We get down to uh, the limb example and uh, compact uh, Einstein, compact hyperbolic three manifolds, maybe one or two others, but perhaps I'll just go to my very last slide and um, list a whole lot of questions. So the 
biggest question, of course, is say you manage to find all the near horizon geometries for a given dimension. Can you now find all the degenerate uh, stationary black holes? How do you do that? You have to give more, uh, more data than, uh, than just the near horizon geometry, that's clear, but what should it be? Uh, in particular, can you do this for a uh, limb found in three horizon dimensions, uh, negative cosmological constants found um, metrics on the uh, quotient of the Heisenberg group. She found that so-called nil manifolds. Uh, she found the example we had. There might have been, oh, and uh, she found examples where the uh, horizon was a Birgé sphere. Um, I have not said anything about non-exact X. One of the uh, other questions is Lim dealt with the three-dimensional homogeneous manifolds, in particular three-dimensional Lie groups. Four-dimensional ones, you can find lists of lows. Um, someone's got some spare time. Uh, and these are um, uh, degenerate black holes come up with matter, the Reisner and Nordstrom being an example. How do you really account for matter in this theory? Because you need an energy condition and the matter on the horizon doesn't naturally obey an energy condition that would come from the space-time uh, uh, energy conditions. So what would you do there? Uh, it turns out people usually work in supergravity, which means that the matter content is essentially um, given to you so that you don't need energy conditions. It's given by equations. And with that, I think I've used all my time. So I'll stop.